My apologies, Juan. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to skip. So I have a series of slides on some examples uh, from my research of uh, feature detection. I'm going to skip all of those. Uh, they were just a little aside um, anyway. Uh, we're going to uh, just finish it off with uh, Huff transforms. Uh, so this is a really popular way to, um, or a popular step for feature detection. So Huff transforms are a class of algorithms. Uh, so there's, for example, a Huff line transform, a probabilistic Huff transform. Uh, we're going to be using what's called the uh, circular Huff transform for circle detection. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to go back to our coins image. Um, so this is the image that we looked at earlier. I'm going to take a slice of it, so the first 95 uh, rows and some column slices as well, just so I can isolate uh, three different coins, just so it's easier to see. Uh, so we can, of course, do uh, the candy or run the candy filter on our image uh, with some appropriate values, and we can get a pretty good result uh, just from these values. Um, so we get the edges of the circles um, for all three coins. So that's great, but this doesn't actually tell us enough about um, a circle if we want to measure it. So what's the center position of the circle? What's the radius of the circle? Um, just with this edge image, you don't have that information. So what we're going to do is called the, the Huff transform. Uh, so for the Huff transform, the Huff circle transform, you need to pass in your edge image. So we're just reusing this uh, canny filtered image. And we also need to pass in some radii. So these are the pixel radii that I'm searching. And in this case, I'm searching um, about 15 pixels in radius up to about 30 pixels in radius by steps of two. So this is 15, 17, 19, et cetera. And those are the radii that I'm looking for. Uh, so let's take a look at the Huff response. So the output of this function is something that looks kind of image-like. Um, so the edges had a shape of 95 and 190. Um, the Huff response uh, has those same dimensions in the first and second axis, um, but the zeroth axis uh, is eight. Um, so what? Where did that eight come from? Yeah, so we, we're looking for eight specific radii. We, that's what we passed to this function. Uh, so we have uh, eight different uh, uh, responses, essentially. Uh, so I have a, I have a little widget uh, below to show you what um, the result looks like. But before that, I just want to quickly, quickly explain um, the result. So here's, here's the, the Huff response for a radius of 21. And you, you get these sort of rings. So what the, the Huff transform is trying to do is it takes an image. So let's say this is my coin. And then it takes a convolution mask, or it takes a mask, and counts the number of pixels in that image. So let's say I start off in my top left corner. Oh, and that's not. Uh, so it takes the pixels in that region, and it counts up the number of edges or, or uh, edge points in that region. And it does this all over the image. So it just does the same thing as convolution, moving back and forth. Whenever we get to the tangent of, a, of an existing circle, it's going to mark that spot. It's going to say that there's a lot of pixels that are on this edge. And it's going to mark that. And then when it moves over here, it's going to mark that. And so you get these kind of rings around. And that's on the outside. If you do this on the inside as well, uh, then the, the circles should be the same size. But uh, forgive me. Um, it's going to mark that point as well. So you end up seeing uh, rings. And as you increase the size of this, uh, this circle, this these points that form this ring are going to converge into a, a, a dot. And that's the center of our circle. So if we actually look through, so if we actually look at this little widget, uh, then we're starting off with, oh, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, we're starting off with a very small radius uh, circle. And we're scanning the whole image. And we get these rings around the actual coin, like I said. And as we increase um, uh, the size of our search circle, 
then these points converge into a hot spot right on the smallest coin. And when you increase some more, uh, it converges into our second largest coin. And then as we increase some more, uh, we increase or we, we find our last largest coin. So I was going to run through an exercise. I think I'm going to have to stop here. Um, the basic idea was to find the hot spots here. So this, this Huff response doesn't tell you where the center of the circle is yet. You actually have to detect that in these images. And the whole point uh, in how you do that is you use some uh, local maxima detection. Um, so there's a function in scikit-image called peak local max, and you can give it a window in which to look for uh, maxima. Uh, and that, that, in that way, you find the most likely centers for your circles. Um, but I'm going to have to skip this exercise and hand it over to Juan. All right, so while I do this, why don't you open up the next step, which is morphological operations. Is that big enough for people in the back? No? OK. Thanks. All right, so here we go. So what is morphological operations? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, here we go. So, morphology, as the name implies, study of shapes. Um, and they're basically a small set of really simple operations, and they can get you really far. Um, as we will see later. Um, so the first two that we're going to look at are erosion and dilation. Um, and all they're doing is looking at the neighborhood. And in erosion, you substitute the pixel by the smallest of its neighbors. Uh, and you do that at every position in the image. And in dilation, you do the opposite. Um, so let's have a look. Um, so this is the setup that we've been using for the rest, for you know, the whole rest of the tutorials. NumPy, get my plot lib, set it in line, import SK demo, and set up um, the color map and the interpolation. Uh, one thing I've changed is uh, I'm going to use Cube Helix, uh, which um, basically it accentuates some of the differences in grayscale, but it has a nice property, which is that if you remove the color, it'll still look like a nice grayscale image, which is not the case for things like Jet. Um, OK, so run that. And then, again, we're going to use this tiny little um, square as our image. Um, so that's all it is. A uh, white square with a padding of two around um, the black. Um, OK, so the first thing to know about morphology is that um, you need a structuring element. And that's kind of like the kernel for the filter. And um, sometimes it's called a footprint. And it's basically defining the neighborhood of the pixel, because um, you can define it many different ways. So if you're looking at the immediate neighborhood, do you look at the neighbors at the diagonal or not? Um, and so that's what these are. Um, so you can see a square um, from the morphology. You have a few different elements that you can make. So you can make a square of width 3. And so that's the center pixel and all of the surrounding pixels. A diamond will do um, 
basically everything that's a square distance of that number. So this is the radius. So actually, let's try some bigger things um, so you can see. Um, let's do a diamond of three. OK, and actually, let's re replace these with IM shows. OK, so that's the diamond. I just replaced it. Uh, Oh, I know what I'm going to do. OK, so square, it's all white, no big surprises. Um, diamond gives you this. And we also have a nice one, which is, so the reason I picked square and diamond for the tutorial is we're looking at tiny images. So we're only going to look at the immediate neighborhood. Um, but when you're looking at big images, I think the assumption that you want is that every direction is treated in the same way, even diagonals. And so then you use um, a disk. And let's just set the radius to 5. And does that show anything? Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be an approximation of a disk, as you can see. <laughs> if you do a bigger radius, it'll be a bigger approximation. There you go. All right, um, so I guess hopefully everyone understands what we're doing here. We're just defining everything that's set to white. This is the pixel that you're considering, and everything that's set to white around it are its neighbors. Um, so now if we look at the square that we made originally, and we do an erosion with a square filter. Oh, sorry, I need to go back and replace these for their original um, sizes. Okay. So let's do an erosion that's not too big. So it's just a simple square. So when you look at this pixel, you take the minimum, it's still black. If you take this pixel, you look at its neighbors, uh, it's going to be black. So that's why this pixel here has been uh, turned black, same for all of these. The only one that doesn't is the central pixel because it's surrounded by all white pixels. So that's your erosion. Um, similarly, for dilation, you just get the expanded uh, image. And if you do a dilation with the diamond, um, you miss the corners. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Um, OK, so now it gets a bit more interesting. Um, Um, no, um, because, well, you, usually when you do convolution, uh, what you mean is you're taking everything that the neighbor, and then you're multiplying and summing everything together, whereas here we're doing a min and a max. So it's a slightly different operation. Yeah, so here it's all just, um, it's actually Boolean arrays um, of whether or not something is considered a neighbor. <coughs> um, OK, so this is the image we're looking at now. Um, and basically, it's just a circle with a slightly thinner um, boundary on one side. Um, and so what I want you to do is uh, spend a minute thinking about what happens when you do an erosion to this image, and then you do a dilation. Uh, with, say, the square structuring element. Um, and conversely, what happens when you do the reverse? Um, so you can think about it. You can draw it on paper. Often it's uh, useful to look at the actual numbers um, and imagine the footprint going through it. Um, if someone has the answer, you can raise your hand. Yeah, correct. But everything else, what about the rest of the image? And go for it.
What about the reverse operation? If you do a dilation and then an inversion? Sorry? Yeah, that's right. So if you do an erosion here, this disappears and all of this becomes a lot thinner, just like the square became a dot. But when you do dilation again, all of these um, white squares will get refilled, but these won't because this bit will have um, disappeared. So that's what an opening is. When you do an erosion and then a dilation, it's called an opening because you're opening these holes. Um, and conversely, if you do a dilation, then this hole will disappear. And when you do an erosion afterwards, it's not going to get restored. So that's called closing. So if you try it, that's your opening result. And that's your closing result. OK? Um, so they're basically ways to get your image to be slightly invariant, but clean up some of these um, you know, defects, or depending on what you're, you're dealing with. Um, you might want to use these operations. Um, so the one exercise we have here is um, this crop from the Hubble deep, deep field um, that I've shown. And what I want you to do is using um, morphological operations that I've just shown you um, and uh, thresholding, I want you to pick out the large galaxy and get rid of all of the speckle around it. And feel free to raise your hand if you have no idea how to go about this. Does anyone want to volunteer a solution? Well, if you erode it, you, you won't get the full galaxy, right? Yeah. No, but that's fine, because all we, so the target here is to retrieve the pixels, right? And so what you do is, Okay, so what's a nice radius um, that's going to preserve the galaxy? Let's just say um, 10. So that'll get rid of any th bright things that are smaller than 10 um, in radius. Um, let's go down to 8, I think. Okay, and then we do L equals. Oh, I 
if this happened. Oh, precision loss, that's fine. Um, okay, so this is what you get with the galaxy. Um, so it's all burned out, but now you just say selection equals, uh, let's just do escape. Uh, Okay, so the vast majority of the pixels are way over here, so if we choose a threshold of, say, 50, that might work out. Okay, so we have this this blob. And then if you wanted to measure something about your galaxy, um, say the distribution of intensities, um, or just find the centroid, um, you can do it from this um, blob. So does that make sense to everyone, what we've done? Yeah. Um, so that's your image. Um, so you see that the radius is well greater than 8. So we're comfortable with doing a disk of radius 8 as your structuring element. And then we do an opening. And that gives us something that is very dark anywhere except around this galaxy. And then when you threshold that image, you can retrieve all of the pixels corresponding to the galaxy. Yeah? Well, so um, scipy.nd image makes a distinction between binary and grayscale opening. Um, but they're really the same thing. You're taking the minimum. So in a binary image, that just happens to be 0 between 0 and 1. Here, it can be anything. Um, but it's always just the minimum over that neighborhood that you've defined with the structuring element. Yep. So um, two ero depending on what structuring element you use, um, two erosion operators uh, with, for example, a diamond operator will give you a single one with a bigger diamond operator. It's exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but they, they're, they're equivalent operations for some structuring element correspondence. Um, in particular, in um, ND image, there's this thing called iterate structure. And so if you take a structure, iterate it, and um, do a dilation with that, it's the same as doing two dilations with that structure. Or if you dilate one structuring element by your second one, you get the bigger structuring element, and then you can do your original operation. So all of those things are equivalent. Um, well, with NumPy, so what I would do is I would take this. I'm not an astronomer, so I don't really know what I would do. <laughs> but uh, in my case, I'm interested in um, biological images. I would want to select all of the um, pixels corresponding to a cell, and I would want to measure the distribution of of fluorescence intensities along that image. Um, yeah. So I, I can also do like say, um, so let's just say um, gal, gal selector no greater than 50, and I just want to do plt.hist of, uh, so your original image, but you select out the pixels um, <coughs> given that you found using these operations. Uh, let's do bins 100, because otherwise it always looks ugly. Oh, let's do it. Where did that just, ah, there it is. Okay, so now you get the distribution of intensities throughout the galaxy. 
Okay, so that's um, an introduction to morphology, and um, it's simple enough, I hope. Um, and later we'll see how you can use it to clean up, um, do slightly more um, sophisticated cleanup operations than the one we did. Um, yeah. Okay, so done with that notebook. Uh, let's move on to go back to your index segmentation. I think if you're in the notebooks list, it's number four segmentation. Okay, so let's get rid of the these. All right, so segmentation, as uh, t Tony mentioned, uh, is the division of an image into meaningful regions. And if you've seen the Terminator, then you've seen segmentation. So this is an image that the Terminator's seeing, and he's segmenting out the human, and it's not looking good for him. Um, Okay, so in scikit image, you can find segmentation functions um, under segmentation. And uh, there's one exception, which is watershed. And the reason is because watershed is both morphology and segmentation. So that's under morphology. But you can use it, as we'll see, for, for segmentation. Um, and there's fundamentally, I think, there's two kinds um, of segmentation that we deal with. One is contrast-based, where you're trying to distinguish objects where the property of the object, some property of the whole object is different from um, other parts of the image. Um, and boundary-based, where you're trying to figure out which objects are separated by edges. Um, so hopefully that distinction will be clear by the end of this. Um, okay, so let's start with contrast. Um, and slick is a really good um, algorithm to do that. Um, it stands for simple linear iterated or iterative clustering. Um, and all it's doing is k-means. Is anyone not familiar with k-means? Okay. K-means is one of this. Yeah, everyone knows it? Okay. Um, good. So all that slick is doing is k-means clustering on a concatenated vector of the coordinates of a pixel and the color of a pixel. Um, so, yeah, so pixels that are close in color will tend to be in the same segment, and pixels that are close in space will tend to be in the same segment. Um, and pixels that are close in both will definitely be in the same segment. Um, so, let's give it a go. And there, so, it takes two parameters uh, one's the desired number of segments. So, uh, just like with k means, you're picking your k. And the other one is the compactness, which is how much weight do we assign to color and to space, since they're two um, very different scales. OK, usual setup. Um, taken this image from um, Flickr. Um, and so we're going to read it. But I've actually saved it so that we don't all hammer the network. Uh, we'll read it locally. and then. We make the call to slick um, with 18 segments, compactness of 10. Um, and so let's have a look. All right, so uh, essentially, yeah, I just looked at how many bits of spices there were and added a bit to it. <laughs> um, Where, sorry? Image. Uh, yeah, it is an umpire. array. Yeah. So again, this is kind of like our main selling point for scikit images that you're just dealing with umpire arrays. Um, and that opens up a lot of nice things. Um, OK, so this is the segments. And um, two things about it. First of all, it's an image. Um, the, the labels array that has the same spatial dimensions as the um, original image, but it doesn't have color. And every segment is a different integer. So if two pixels are in the same segment, according to Slick, they end up in the same um, integer bin. Um, and you can see that here, uh, we're not doing like a fantastic job at segmenting. Um, 
but it's doing something. So this particular region is all one segment. This particular region is split up a bit. Um, but here, you've got two segments in the lights and shadows of the thing. So can anyone tell me why that might be? It's one of those. Um, actually, I wouldn't, yeah. So basically, it is contrast, and it is the compactness. And it's because the color space is not getting weighted enough. Or sorry, it's getting weighted too much. So pixels will only cluster with pixels of their own color. Um, and so you jack up the compactness. Let me, the reason it's called compactness um, is because if you, it's, it's really, it's the weight given to the space. And if you jack it way up, then you're only clustering in space. And you're just going to make these little boxes. Um, so actually, you can try that now if you jack up to the compactness to like 2,000. You will just get squares. Yeah. OK? So you're just clustering pixels that are close together. Um, all right. Um, the other thing is that, as you saw, we're just labeling the pixels according to their index here. And you just get them according to where the original mean um, started. And that means that you're going to get low contrast between adjacent um, regions. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to write this function, which is in scikit image master, but not in, um, not in the 0 0.10 version that you probably have. Um, but basically, all we're, do all we're doing is um, taking a segment, finding out the average color of those pixels um, belonging to the segment, and just coloring that segment by that value. OK? And so if we do that, actually, let me go back to the a good value for this. A reasonable. OK, so now each segment reflects the, the color underneath it. Um, OK. So as I, I just, just mentioned, light and dark parts um, are clustering separately, um, which is not really what we want. Um, so essentially, if we go back to the definition of segmentation, uh, you want to be meaningful regions. And lights and shadows are not really that meaningful. You want objects that are the same thing. Um, so one of the things that Slick has is this thing called enforced connectivity, which makes sure that you don't get segments in isolated patches like this. You want to make sure that every segment is one big blob. Um, so let's try doing enforced connectivity equals true, and then find the representation of the segmentation using mean color, and then show both of those. OK. Can someone tell me what just happened? Sorry? Exactly. So enforced connectivity is, a, is basically the dumbest way that you could do it. And um, all it's doing is if something is isolated, it merges it to the segment next to it. Um, so all of these little beans um, will get merged to this segment, which was you know, made by color. And so when you do this recursively for all of the different isolated segments, you get way too much merging going on. Um, so one way to, another way to get rid of this texture is to use uh, Gaussian blur, which um, Tony talked about. And um, that's done so often in Slick that it's built in. So you just pass a sigma, and you get a Gaussian, Gaussian blurred image. And then um, it does the slick on that. OK, so now it's still not perfect, but it's a lot better, right? Um, so I'll point out that a lot of segmentation is um, this early experimentation stage of trying to figure out what parameters work for the kind of image that you're trying to segment, um, which is why I didn't magically pick all of the right parameters at the start. Um, so again, so now we see that there's still a lot of merging going on. Let's increase the number of segments um, to prevent that. All right. And once again, um, so we talked about compactness, but that wasn't in the program. So now we're actually talking about compactness. 
Um, so you can see that a lot of these segments are extremely squiggly. So this over here is the same segment as this over here. Um, we ideally want our objects to be more compact, so let's just increase it a bit, not as dramatically as before. Okay, and now it's basically starting to look like the right thing, although here, and I don't know if we can fix this, but you can see this shadow is sort of overwhelming um, the function and it's getting into two different segments. Um, so as the exercise for this section, um, we're gonna try to write um, an interactive widget so that you can fiddle with all the parameters of Slick and try to get it to something that you're happy with. Is there any questions about how all of this worked? Okay, so just try to edit um, this section in such a way that um, you can play with all the parameters of um, Slick that I just showed you and, um, and get something a bit nicer. Um, and one piece of advice that I would do is instead of using interact, do dot interactive, which gives you back the widget object. And um, because this runs fairly slowly, because you're iterating over all the labels and trying to find the mean color and so on, um, what you want to do is w dot, I think it's message, is it MST throttle? Yep. And set that to one. Um, so what this does is when you start sliding the um, a parameter slider, it's never going to compute more than one um, parameter value until it computes the one at where you stop the slider. Oh, yeah, yeah.
All right. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm going to look at. So, this is what I've come up with. Um, I think there's still a bit of playing around with all the parameters, but um, essentially, using the um, IPython widgets, um, you can quickly explore the, all the parameters based first look for um, whatever images you're interested in. Um, I'll also point out that slick and the watershed method that we will go talk about um, later. Um, they're both considered super pixel methods in that uh, very rarely will you actually want to use the output from these functions straight away as opposed to um, using them as a starting point for more sophisticated methods. Um, and scikit image is only just starting to um, build those. Um, Oh, sorry, super pixels. I hate that word, actually. So it's a good question. Um, it's basically, um, the logic behind using that word is that it's, pixel stands for picture element. And so if you think about these very small segments, they're kind of like a picture element because they're the smallest unit that you know is a single unit. Um, so it's, it's basically a small agglomeration of pixels. Um, Sub-segments would be another way to, to call them. Um, and so in this particular case, for example, you might merge these three uh, using a downstream algorithm um, because at least I'm having a hard time finding the right parameters for to segment this um, part of the image into a single segment. Um, how are we doing for time? I think I'll probably just um, skip this exercise. You guys can um, do it in your own time and come ask me questions be here through, throughout the conference and the sprints. Um, but the basic idea is that there's a slick zero parameter for slick that will use different compactness settings for different parts of the image depending on how textured it is. Um, I'm not sure how well it works on this actually, um, but it's worth um, trying it out on this one. Um, okay, so I'll go into the other um, type of segmentation that we do, and that's um, boundary images. Um, so essentially, we're going to go, we're going to use all the edge finding, not all the edge finding, some of the edge finding that Tony talked about. Um, so we'll import coins, and we'll do the Sobel filter so we get some edges. Um, and that's what it looks like. Um, so this is that uh, cube helix color, color map that I was talking about. So you can see that it's easier to distinguish between the very bright and just grayish parts of the image thanks to the, the color. Um, and actually, if you look at it, you can do 
So that, that shows you what the color map is. Um, so it's increasing in intensity while also varying in color. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Watershed is designed to find regions between these edges. Um, and the way it does this is by looking at this intensity as if it were a topographic map, as if it were height. Um, and then it starts flooding, flooding the image, and it's finding bits where the water gets trapped. Does that make sense to people? Um, so we'll do um, an, a one-dimensional example of this. Um, so here I'm just going to do... Uh, sorry, what? Oh, you might have, yeah, you might need to do a git pull for sure. Um, yep, sorry about that. Um, some later uh, additions. That's right. I, I, don't think, I don't think you should come prepared to these conferences. I mean, what do you think this is? <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Um, so, sorry, I'm going to keep moving. Um, so the image here is just one dimensional. I'm just making it 2D with these two brackets so that the watershed function doesn't choke. Um, but this is sort of the intensity here. So you have like a little basin and it goes up, that's a peak. Smaller basin, big peak, basin, and then another basin here at the end, okay? Um, and watershed takes seeds, which are just the points that the water is flowing out of. Um, so here, as the seeds, we're just going to pick any point where there's a zero. Um, okay, and then we're just going to plot the image. Uh, again, it's one dimensional, so it just, it's just lines. And then we're going to plot the watershed of that image, which are the labels. Um, this isn't super pretty, but uh, it gets the point across. So this is the landscape, right? And it's flooded from here leftwards to this peak. It's flooded from here to this peak and not quite reaching this peak. And it's flooded from here throughout until it doesn't reach this peak. Is that clear? Does anyone have questions about that? Basically, it floods, it floods all the way. It's just that it keeps track of where it's flooding from. And so when two different basins meet, that's called the watershed line. And they don't get merged, they just... Okay. Um, so for the coins image, the challenge is to find some nice seeds, right? Um, so ideally what you want to do is find one seed within each coin and one seed outside, but that's not super trivial, but we'll do our best. Um, so the first part is we, we see that, so the, the thing that Watershed has difficulty with is like sometimes it'll you know, reach this bit here and then just flood out depending on um, what else is going on in the Watershed. Um, so what you want to do is put a single seed in each coin. Um, and you want to make use of the good edges uh, to find the right places for seeds. So what we're going to do is we're going to threshold this image and we're going to do a distance transform to find the center of, of the coins. Okay. So, again, this is, um, this is why we like uh, using NumPy arrays as our images, um, because we get all of the SciPy functions for free. Um, and in particular, um, SciPy's ND image module uh, has this distance transform. And what that's doing is, <clears throat> for many points that are zero in your image, it's computing the distance from every other point to the closest zero point. Um, and that's what this is. So this is really far from any zero point. Um, this is the farthest it is from any of these, right? So this is the edge of the coin. Let me just do. Do you know what happened to me? It, do, does it try to rescale all the images to the same scale? Yeah. Okay. Well, we can't do this then. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I could do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one of your exercises is going to be to find nice seeds, so you can try that. I hadn't even thought of that one. Um, OK, I don't know why the coins aren't displaying, but you can see that the centers are where the peaks are. Um, but some coins that don't have a very strong edge towards the top get this sort of weird artifact there. Um, OK, and then what Tony didn't get to talk about is this peak local max, which is just going to find the, these points, where, which are maximal. Um, and then it just gives you the coordinates. So we need to make a zeros image um, with those coordinates, then use those coordinates to um, set them as true, and then get the seeds using MD images label um, and what that does is it gives you, for every non-zero element it gives you, that is connected, it gives you a distinct label. So now we get an image where every seed has a unique identifier. And then we just run watershed on the edges and the seeds. Um, and we use this function which basically overlays the coins image with the um, watershed segmentations. Okay, and so that's the, um, the segmentation. You can see one of the strengths of Watershed is it has very clean um, edges um, between the different regions. One of the weaknesses is that if you don't have a seed, well, it can't recover from that. Um, so you can see we've missed a few of these coins. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of um, different points. Um, so the exercise um, is try to figure out some different way to find the seeds and uh, see if you can get an improved watershed segmentation, um, which is not too hard with this image. Like it's, it's a good one to do, to do watershed in. As usual, raise your hand if you want some suggestions. Or different kind of technical help. And actually, what time is it? Uh, work as much as you want on it and have a break and we'll reconvene <coughs> at 10 past.